Hello and welcome to MS Alta Live. Today, Peter the Tender will be with us and we will be talking about Azure Pipelines. Uh, Peter, welcome. How are you? Uh, doing good. Thank you for uh, having me. How are you? I am fine. Thank you. <clears throat> so before we start, can you please introduce yourself? Um, sure. So my name is Peter, uh, based out of Belgium, and currently working as an Azure technical trainer within Microsoft. And it's probably one of the well, easiest and most descriptive job roles within the whole Microsoft, I guess. Um, so what I do is uh, providing Azure technical training every single week to customers all over the world. But for now, it's virtual before it was traveling. And okay, in a yeah. little bit of free time that I have, um, I still go back to the Azure world by um, presenting sessions like this one is mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite hobbies, I would say. Um, as you can see, I've been publishing a couple of books I started um, almost nine years ago was my first adventure. And as you might know, you go like, well, this is so hard, writing a book, so much yeah, time dedication. And at the end of the first one, I was like, I'm never going to do this again. And in the meantime, I'm writing number eight. So it's almost like one book per year to just keep me busy in, in my, my free time. Okay, that's a great hobby, by the way. Uh, I don't want to ask the classical questions, what is DevOps? So I want to ask you, what is the main components or services does Azure DevOps have? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, there's nothing wrong in asking like, what is um, what is DevOps? And I might start with that one to maybe move over to like the, the Azure world. And by the way, for the ones who are watching, um, this is like the only slide I have. So um, I wanted to do this like a full demo style uh, presentation where Mert is going to ask me a few questions. I have no idea what he's going to ask, but I think that the first logic question is, um, like, what is DevOps or what is Azure DevOps and, and how can we use it? So I'm going to close PowerPoint for now. And I'll share some contact details if you want to follow my blog, if you want to reach out on Twitter, uh, feel free to do so. But let me start with maybe looping in a little whiteboard. Is that going to help for the ones who don't really know, like, what is DevOps? Why should we look into it? And, and why should we start using it? And it could just help in, in making the rest of the session a, a little bit more like entertaining, but also having some touch points where DevOps could help you in your day to day um, IT job or the application lifecycle or workload, uh, keeping them alive. That's the idea. So the, the first thing about DevOps is that it helps you if you look at like the official Microsoft uh, definition, even if you want, it's a combination of a team, what we call people, a project, and the product. So those three are coming together and it's a continuous journey. So probably if you look a little bit into like the DevOps way of working, you've probably seen something like this before. But it starts with the planning phase. That's where you think about um, what kind of scenario are we going to build? What kind of technology are we going to use? Is it like a web application, uh, maybe e-commerce or anything else? Not important. And we're going to use .NET. We're going to use Java. We're going to use um, Node apps or anything else. We're going to run it on premises. We're going to run it in Azure. We're going to run it in containers. So that's like the, the architecting the planning phase. From there, you're probably going to develop it, where it's partly the developers doing their work, but it's also looking into um, the, the systems backend, deploying Azure resources, virtual machines, containers, web app services, and anything else you need for your workload. From there, you're going to build it, where in the build, you typically validate, like, this is my source code. These are my, I don't know, ARM templates, if Azure is your backend. Um, maybe your VMware golden image, uh, something like that. And you're going to evaluate that everything is actually working fine. From there, you move into a release. There are a couple of in-between steps where you might run some validation or integrating testing could be another one, like a functional testing, user testing, those kind of scenarios. 
Um, but eventually, when everything has been tested, you're going to move it into release, which could be some environment, dev and test, staging, production, um, maybe even canary deployments, early adopter, if you think about like Edge Browser or Windows Preview, Windows 10 Preview. Um, somebody's building it, like a whole team is building it. And if you want, you could participate in, in like beta testing. So it's uh, release, something is running, but it's not only in a production environment. And as you all know, once it's running, it means you need to monitor it, you need to maintain it, you need to manage it. And from there, you're going to capture feedback. And that's your initial starting point. And from there, that continuous loop is coming back. Now, why is that important? Because once you know this cycle, like the, the life cycle of your application workload, the infrastructure, the application, and everything around it, that's literally what Azure DevOps is going to give you. So you got Azure DevOps in two scenarios. You have the cloud-based service, but you could also deploy um, Azure DevOps server in your on-prem environment, virtual machine-based. Now, I'll walk you through for the ones who want on how to get started in maybe another demo, but let me dive in in just one example. So everything in Azure DevOps is organized around the project. Now, you could start with one single project for everything. You could move into uh, different projects for different applications, different purposes. That's what I'm doing, just to keep it a little bit structured. Now, without doing too much besides creating your project, it's going to give you a couple of functional components. So the first one is Azure Boards. That's where you find like the, the project management. Think back about the DevOps definition. It's um, people, projects, and producing value or creating a product, which could be an application, could be um, optimizing, <coughs> sorry, optimizing deployments. That would be the idea. So when you have DevOps starting point, you create a project, and within, you're going to use boards. If you think back about the whiteboard diagram, it's everything that's, um, let's pick another color. It's everything that lives here. That's where you're going to create what we call work items. So think of it as a to-do list of tasks. But it could also um, be used to collect like bugging information. From the developers, that's where the feedback part comes in from the developers, but also from your customers. If you, for example, if you think about um, a lot of like mobile apps today or even Teams, we're using it um, ourselves. When you close the call, it's gonna ask you like a, a star uh, rating. Now you could look at it as feedback because if at some point in time, everybody's complaining like giving you a one star or maybe a two star rating, it's probably like in a, in a collaboration tool or a communication tool like a Teams, Zoom, WhatsApp even is asking you the question. And you're typically going to complain about performance that the sound quality wasn't that good or the video streaming didn't work. And based on that, you could actually go back to the planning stage and maybe scaling up your servers or scaling out your servers. So that's where the Azure boards can um, help you. Then in the build and validation and testing, that's where we talk about pipelines, where a pipeline, and I'll probably do some demos on that later on. A pipeline is a little bit wrong for now, but easy said, it's nothing more than a task um, sequence. Connect to Azure step one, deploy a storage account, deploy a resource group first of all, deploy a storage account, install some application software. From there, inject the work items, reporting, and everything else is there. Mm -hmm. And I'm using Azure as an example, but it doesn't need to be Azure. So the confusing part with Azure DevOps is that you could only use it to deploy Azure uh, resources, but that's not at all the case. So Azure DevOps by itself is quite flexible, and I'll show you that later on. If you want to use Azure DevOps as the pipeline or the DevOps um, engine, to communicate with on-prem servers to deploy software, you can do that. If you want to communicate with AWS, with uh, Google Cloud, with Kubernetes environments, um, you can do that. So that was boards, 
The repo is um, a Git compatible source control system. So if you're a little bit familiar with um, GitHub, the, the public version or even the private one, that's where you're going to store your templates, ARM templates, CloudFormation templates, Terraform templates, but also your application source code. From there, moving into pipelines, turning them into what we call an artifact. And out of that artifact, you're going to run a step-by-step -step sequence. Some of them are working, some of them are not, to show you that not everything in Azure DevOps um, is always successful from the first step. And um, I've obviously built this on purpose. But that's really your uh, pipeline engine, the step-by-step -step task sequence with a lot of capabilities and a lot of really cool stuff that I'm going to show you. I mean, we talked about Azure DevOps Cloud Magic for a reason. Artifacts is where you're going to integrate like a centralized um, package manager. If you use like .NET, you got the NuGet packagers. If you have um, Java apps, you're going to use Maven. If you use Node, you're going to use NPM. And instead of storing all those packages on each and every development workstation, you could now move them into um, a centralized overview and telling developers to go out and only use like your internal organizational approved um, artifacts. So that's in short what um, Azure DevOps stands for. So pipelines, project management out of Azure boards, a lot of really cool dynamics. Obviously, the heart, the, the, the core of the product is probably pipelines. But again, it's also quite flexible. If you use any of the other tools, I don't know if you use Jenkins. I think it's one of the, the popular uh, pipeline tools. Nothing is forcing you away from Jenkins, but you could perfectly use Jenkins to, for example, use this first part, everything on the left side, what we call CI, continuous integration. It means that whenever we have a change in, for example, the build, you already heard it's a Git compatible. So if you pick it up and a developer or a DevOps engineer, we should say, is checking in uh, checking in code, committing changes, running pull request updates, um, anything like that, instead of waiting for a new pipeline to be triggered, it could be automated. And that's a continuous integration. Once we pick up our artifact, that would be up here somewhere, like literally the output of my pipeline scenario, moving that into a running state, that's what we call release. Or if we move this into a continuous motion, that's where the continuous deployment or continuous um, delivery comes from. And you could mix. So another popular tool um, is Jira for the, the project management. If you want to use Jira or keep using it instead of boards, that's totally fine. If you want to use GitHub, as your repository instead of Azure repos, that's also an option. So a lot of flexibility. It's a complete set of tools. If you don't want to use all of it, that's perfectly fine. If you want to use everything, that's even more awesome. So um, that's Azure DevOps in 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. So you mentioned about um, CICD, and you said uh, say this, continuous deployment and continuous delivery. So mm -hmm. what is different between continuous deployment and continuous delivery? It sounds similar, but I think it's a very different meaning. But that's, um, I would say, an interesting question. And, and it's also um, a little bit confusing because like different environments, different tools are presenting it slightly different. So the way I see it, and I'm not even sure if that's like an official definition, but when, when I think about Continuous delivery, it's where your DevOps team is creating a new version of an application, for example, and creating a new artifact. But it doesn't always mean that your end users are going to use that specific version. You're still going to release it. You're going to run it, moving it into a running state. But that could be in a dev and test scenario where no real users are actually using that application on a day-to-day -day basis, where if you look at a continuous deployment, that's where you're going to move it into a running state, but also the end users um, giving access to that environment. And again, if you 
think back about the traditional way of working, like a dev and test environment, we have a subset of users, or maybe not even users, connecting to the application. We keep the testing um, internally within the DevOps um, team. Or maybe if you look at like a Canary deployments or Canary release, it means that you're going to create like a, a beta version of your application and already asking users to provide feedback, but they can use it on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's the, I would say, the confusing part between the continuous delivery, continuous deployment, where the delivery is like, we're going to hand it over to the user almost like we have an application ready to be used, where with the deployment, you're just yeah, mainly testing, like, this is my starting point, my source code, my templates. I'm going to squeeze everything together, and I'm going to see if everything is working as it should be. But again, some other definitions are available. Some other tools are mixing it a little bit. Um, I think based on the capability um, of the product itself, and that's the uh, the confusing part. Ultimately, you're going to work towards the end-to-end the -end automation, running the CI/CD pipelines, as um, as it's called, and meaning that this loop, as you can see it here, is is getting repeated whenever something is changing in the source code, in templates, in PowerShell scripts, uh, CLI scripts, anything else. We're going to trigger a new pipeline. We're going to deploy it, and eventually it's re uh, getting released, and the end user can start using the application. That's um, how I would describe it. OK, thank you. So can you show us a simple pipeline? Um, sure. Yeah, I need to keep my voice a little bit greased because um, with a little bit of the nicer weather coming up, it's not as good uh, because I'm getting a little bit allergic. And every now and then it's uh, breaking up my voice a little bit. But if I take a little sip of water every now and then, it should be uh, should be OK. So before jumping into the, the pipelines itself, um, I'll start with repos. I could do a couple of different scenarios there. But um, let's start with probably one of the easiest examples and running an ARM template deployment. So I have one example here. I'm not using pull requests. I'm not using commits. I don't have any specific source control versioning. but I do have an ARM template. And as you could figure out from the name, I want to deploy VPN components. Probably one of the most perfect ways to demonstrate ARM templates, because it allows you to automate the deployment, although it's not super hard. Um, it's taking quite, quite a while, like 20, 25 minutes. And it's going to ask you a lot of questions about networking, subnets, VNets, everything. So move that into a template, where now we're going to run this in a pipeline. Now, within Azure DevOps, there's two different ways to um, create a pipeline. The first option actually coming from the tooling before it was called Azure DevOps, uh, Visual Studio Online. Before that, it was called uh, TFS or Team Foundation Server. And that's where everything was, if you think back like five, six, and, and more years. Uh, back in time, within the, the Microsoft world, it was typically like, give me a nice looking portal a couple of wizards, and we can start using it. So that's what I'll use for now. But in meantime, we call it classic editor. So it's not the standard scenario anymore, because we moved to YAML like a scripted um, syntax language. And I'll show you the two possible options there. But showing you how easy it is. So you start with classic. It's literally. Um, four clicks and your pipeline is almost up and running. So you need to select your starting point, like where can I find my source code? And again, I'm using Azure repos, but we support other scenarios as long as they're Git compatible, you're good to go. I select my project. I select my repository where you could create multiple repos within one single project and sharing source code. There's no real guidance if you should do that. Um, you could use like subfolders. My guidance is um, try to create repos in a way that it makes sense. So what I'm doing is creating a repo for 
my front end application, my source code for the back end, source code for some application um, AI integration that might be part of your complete app, and eventually another repo with all my ARM uh, templates in there, just to keep it a bit structured. But again, you don't have to. If you have multiple branches out of your Git, then you could also do that. Now, from here, it's going to ask you um, a couple of questions based on a template. What is a template? It's a set of tasks pre-configured for you, and we're just going to make it a bit easier for you to get started. I'm not going to use this for now, but showing you what this step-by-step -step task model looks like. So I got my sources. And from here, I need to define what I'm going to run out of this pipeline. You can define where you're going to run it, where the default, since I'm using the cloud-based version, I'm using Azure Pipelines agents, the, the build agents, as we call it. And that's the server who's going to execute the, the pipeline step-by-step um, -step task sequence. So nothing is running on your local machine. It's pushing out the source code to a cloud-running server or a self-hosted. A virtual machine running on-prem or running in Azure could be an option. And from there, um, it's going to execute your tasks. Now, ARM is not really, I would say, the most interesting option. But nevertheless, I can show you. Where up here, there is a pre-configured task allowing you to deploy an ARM template. Where you need to complete some settings, pretty straightforward. I know it's not the most interesting example. So let's make it a little bit more exciting and do something with application source code, right? I already have a few of them. So whenever I need to go back, we can easily do that and show you some other examples because I don't want to waste time on waiting for pipelines to complete. But let me first show you the YAML scenario. So we start with the same question. Where can I find my source code? And based on the source code, it's going to help you and identifying like this is an overview of tasks that I think could be pretty relevant for you. So this is ASP.NET, and it's producing a YAML pipeline. If I create multiple ones in the same project, it's um, creating a new sequence number as well. So the first one is called Azure Pipelines.yaml. Every new one is just following that sequence. Now, I can imagine that the next question is like, why should we use Classic? Why should we use YAML? I already answered the question. In the end, it doesn't matter. Whatever works for you, I think, is fine. The benefit of using YAML is that you kind of move to pipeline as code. Because as you could figure out from here, this is my Azure repo where I store my source code for my application. But at the same time, it's also so creating that YAML file in there. Where now, if I make changes out of my um, Git commits, I can integrate pull requests. I can fork the repos and anything else you might know from Git comments. You can now not only use it for application source code, but you could also use it for your pipelines themselves. From there, and I know it's a little bit awkward in the beginning to understand what the YAML file is actually doing and to become familiar with the syntax, but I'll quickly walk you through for this example. So you define the trigger. That's like whenever something's changing, think about that CI um, concept. Whenever something's changing in my branch, I want you to run the pipeline again, where this time it's using the, the master branch or the main branch, but it's an, an old example, so I still need to rename it. Next, what I showed you in Classic, you're going to allocate what kind of build agent, like the, the compile engine, if you want, um, is using as an operating system. Since this application is relying on .NET, it's going to offer me a Windows build server. If it's .NET Core, Java, um, Node, Python, anything else, it's typically Linux, Ubuntu servers, uh, but you could choose. And if you have a Mac platform, you could also use that one as an engine. You can define variables where these ones are just using some parameters for uh, running the pipeline, picking up my Visual Studio solution file, 
running on any platform, 32-bit, 64-bit, and running a release. From there, in the steps, it's literally step-by-step -step task sequence. Again, since it's .NET, it starts with NuGet installed. That's the package manager for .NET applications, similar to NPM, similar to Maven. Um, that would be the idea. Once the NuGet tool is installed, we're going to run NuGet command 2. That's like the YAML um, keyword or the YAML syntax to run um, the, the NuGet package manager. And from there, we're going to run a task called VS build sequence 1. And that's literally executing .NET build, like compiling my .NET source code. And then last, running some functional testing to validate, <coughs> sorry, to validate if everything is working fine. So, uh, may I ask Classic. a question? Uh, sure, yeah, go ahead. Um, as far as I can see, there are some uh, variables like uh, dollar solution, and there are uh, Inbuilt variables. Can we declare our own variables to the pipeline? Um, oh yeah, sure. So yeah, this is just a, a basic example where it's not really storing um, that much information out of uh, like the variable. But if you look down a little bit, and let's see if I can move it down. There we go. But for um, here, for example, I'm using that dollar sign. And then the keyword between brackets, that would be a variable. The build configuration would be a variable. And those are defined as like system variables. It knows what kind of project you want to run. It knows, for example, where um, you want to store the artifact. I could show you in classic as well. So let me switch back to another. Uh, let's do this one. And if I remember, this is a classic one. Yeah, just having one task, but it's perfectly fine. But what I can do here is, for example, using integrated variables from the platform itself. What I'm doing here is grabbing my ARM template and turning it into an artifact. And I'll show you why that could be um, important in the next part of the, the pipeline question. Now, besides using those system variables, you could also come up with your own variables, similar to if you use PowerShell, if you use Bash, and you want to pick up like um, environment uh, variables where you define, I don't know, an access token, you define uh, the Azure resource location or resource group naming conventions or anything like that. So let me switch to release, which by itself is, again, running a pipeline. And let's do virtual machine deployment. Now, in my virtual machine deployment, I'm starting from ARM templates. Um, I move them into an artifact. Why? Because this template deployment is a little bit more complex. It's based on um, linked ARM templates, so multiple templates coming together. I'm using PowerShell um, desired state configuration scripts to configure my web VM to configure a SQL virtual machine. So what I'm doing just to make it a little bit more convenient to use, I go to repos in the pipeline scenario. I go to repos. I pick up all my artifacts or my standalone files if you want, and I move them into a uh, pipeline artifact. The outcome of the pipeline is the starting point for my release. That's um, what this model looks like. We're now within. I'm using Azure CLI. I'm copying some files to Azure Storage. Getting access to Azure Storage requires um, a SAS token, and eventually, back where I started, I'm going to run my ARM template. But now here, I want to use a variable. This is my alias PDT with typically the date, so I remember like when I used my pipeline. Now, as you can see, if I go back to my overall pipelines, I do have, I wouldn't say a lot of them, but at least for this project, I got like 
maybe 8 or 10, where if I go to my releases, where the release is also based on a pipeline, I could use, um, again, some other ones. Now, if imagine that all these standalone pipelines are using shared variables, like since we're deploying towards Azure, you probably need to come up with a resource group name. You need to come up with a storage account name. You need to come up with virtual machine names if they're not hard coded in your um, ARM templates. You need to pick up some software. You need to run PowerShell scripts or anything else. And why not moving to a scenario where you can collect all those variables and reusing them across different pipelines? So what you can do is creating variable groups where you can reuse your own custom ones. I could create a whole list of these. But using variable groups is somehow a little bit more interesting. I'm defining the variable name. This is what I use for container integration. If I want to deploy app services, I need a service name and a plan. I'm integrating Key Vault to store my secrets. Location is always an interesting one, the resource group name, and so on. Where now I can mix hard-coded settings. Location will always be West Europe. Why? Because you already know I'm based out of Belgium, so my closest by Azure region is West Europe. I could use hard-coded names. There's a password here, but don't do that in real life. Perfectly fine for demos, but you shouldn't do that. But you could now also combine your variable and adding something into it. Where now this variable, the ATT alias, is coming from my custom pipeline. Does that answer your question on variables? Yes, thank you. It's super powerful. And then the predefined ones, that's what I showed you, the, the system-based ones, so the build directory is one, the platform choice is another one, so a lot of different capabilities there. Um, let's see what else can I share about pipelines. Uh, maybe we should run one, right? Because now I told you how to create them, but maybe we could actually run one. So this is, again, a pretty basic one, but it's actually doing what it needs to do. It's connecting to Azure repos, reaching out to the ARM um, folder, and from there, moving it into an artifact. And again, that's becoming the starting point. So from here, I can define the agent. I can define the branch I want to use, and we could run it. If you want, you could also um, automate this process. Since we talked about the continuous integration, like instead of waiting for Peter to push the button, um, why not automating this? And while that one is running, which one did I use? This one. So up here in the triggers, it's really this basic setting here, but super powerful. Enable continuous integration. Once I'm activating that setting, and I, there is a source, a change in the source, out of commit, out of pull requests, out of anything else, it's automatically triggering a new build, making sure that my artifact will always be um, compatible with the, the latest source code that we checked in. Or back to the um, YAML file where you had that trigger keyword, that would be the, the same. Whenever there's a change in the main branch or any other branch you define, it's automatically running that new pipeline. So let's see how far we get. It's all green, that's always nice. And we're gonna show you some details. So it is coming from this repo. This is the branch we use. How long it took could be interesting. And the outcome is one artifact and the job was successful. What happened in the backend? 
that's where we communicate with um, the, the build servers or the build agents. It's starting with the source files, running task one, running task two, closing, validating. That's basically it. Now, again, here, there's not too much happening, but it should give you some idea about like the level of detail we expose. It's almost identical to running your command line options yourself. If you're like a developer and you do the, the NuGet, um, NuGet install, next you're going to run the package manager update. Next you're going to run um, .NET build, .NET publish, all those steps. And now you're just going to move them in a step-by-step -step, um, task-based pipeline. YAML-based, classic-based, the outcome will be the same. So now I do have my new artifact. And let's go back to my IS scenario. We have the output of the previous pipeline. And from there, we're going to run production. Just for the fun of it, you can integrate different tasks. So my first task is create a resource group up here. And again, picking up some variables because I already talked about it. So now I can reuse them. Creating a storage account. That's what I'm doing here. If you don't like CLI, but you like Azure PowerShell, obviously the mechanism would be the same. Copying files, it's a pre-configured task that you can reuse. Integrating with your Azure subscriptions. Obviously, you need to have the correct permissions um, to do so. And eventually running my deployment against an Azure resource group, reusing my variables once more. Where the other funny thing about this task is that you can still make changes in the definition. So if you follow the RM template best practice, you have the template skeleton file, the definition file, and the parameter file. That information will be recognized in your pipeline definition. But if you want specific to this task, at least, it will still allow you to um, make changes here. If I don't like this user or I need to change my password uh, because now I exposed it, it's being recorded, the whole internet knows my password, then obviously I'm going to change it. And then let's move into a release. And I'll give this a bit of time to show you like what's happening on the um, build agent. So it starts. So, uh, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, why we are using we are um, using a single target? I mean, only one server or only one environment? Can we create a multi-stage pipeline? Oh uh, yeah, for example, sure. Development test and pro staging production. Um, yeah, definitely. I'll uh, I'll show you that right away. So let's do a quick check on this one. And while it's running, I'll switch to another pipeline and show you like what's happening. So it starts with step one, download artifacts. Step two, running my Azure CLI task. And just give it a second. It's connecting to my Azure backend. And somewhere, if I'm fast enough up here, you can see that it's picking up Azure CLI task script with some random unique number. Why is that? Because I'm not literally giving it a script. I'm giving it the different tasks to uh, perform. So it's not producing output about the actual task it's running, but that's what I can see in the pipeline definition. If you use um, like output echo, for example, in CLI, then it would give you that outcome as well. Every now and then, depending a bit on what the CLI is doing, it's literally going to show you the output, similar to going to Cloud Shell, going to CLI PowerShell, and running like AZ Group Create. That's what I'm doing here. Picking up my variable. Remember, it was PDT with some date, although it's not today, but that's fine. And it's literally adding that as part of my pipeline sequence. In the meantime, it's already moved on to the next step. So let me show you that scenario with different environments. So we talk about um, like multi-staging, where I already talked about multi-stages in, in my whiteboard. Moving it into a running state, dev and test, Q&A production, um, canary deploy, early adopter, general availability, 
You might have heard about like blue-green deployment. That's where you have two environments, but only one is actually being used. Um, A-B testing is another one. So a couple of different possible scenarios. Now, in the end, what you're doing is just changing the target. So let me use this one. It's deploying the same workload, but only using um, app services. And let's add a new stage into it. Just going to do a little time check. Way good. So I got stage one perfectly fine. But let's now define this as my dev stage. And we're going to add a new one. Not using a template. And we're going to call this one um, production. Making it easy. This could be Canary, Early Adopter. So whatever name you want to give it, um, it's not that important. We start from the same starting artifact. We're going to deploy it to our dev environment. And we're going to deploy it to production. Another option is, instead of starting from scratch, is cloning what I have. Why? Because in the end, if I look at this pipeline deploy, it's running a couple of tasks, creating some SQL resources, and eventually deploying an um, Azure App Service. Where now, if I go back to my, let's call this one the second prod, or like the real production, right? There's no better place to test stuff out than in running in a production environment. So what it's happening now is when my dev stage deployment is complete, it's going to execute prod stage. And at the same time, it's going to inject um, the second one. The benefit with cloning the stage is that everything I already have in the previous one is getting reused. So now I could make this a bit more intuitive and defining different names, I could go back into my variables, adding a variable for like dev and test, staging, production, canary, or I could define that here. So let's say this is the environment, dev environment, call dev, and the prod environment. And in my syntax, I want to use I could also define the scope, like where do you want me to use it? So even if I have the exact same environment um, variable, I could still identify like the, the first one is dev, so we're going to allocate it in this scope, and the other one, we're going to use it over here. So a lot of um, flexibility, I would say. So that's the, the multi-staging. I could do the same in uh, YAML. Just going to open a new window to make it a little bit easier for myself. Just need to remember where I stored my example. Could be in my downloads, could be on my desktop. Let's see, multi. I'm so bad in organizing my files. Looks like I need mm -hmm. some source control mechanism to uh, to do that. Let's check on my desktop. If it's not there, the stage pipeline, there it is. Remember, examples always on the desktop. No, they shouldn't be there. They should be in source control, repos, GitHub. Anything like that. But just to show you what it looks like, so we still have the trigger, what I explained earlier. We have the agent backend pool, my variables. But now there's a new keyword showing up, and that's called stages. Where up here I'm simulating a build stage like dev and test staging, um, canary, early adopter. From there, the jobs, that's literally the tasks. Up here, there's a bit more. And the second part of my pipeline is running the release. So it's going to run the first part, prepping everything, running the pipelines, 
creating the artifact, storing them in that staging directory, as you can see up here. And once that step is complete, we can switch to release. So if I import this, I can show you new pipeline. <coughs> Yeah, multi-stage is so much flexible, and there's no limit. I think I never documentation like how many stages can I organize, but most probably a lot of them. Let's see. Oh, it's not going to be here. I first need to move it into my repos, right? Let's do a little bit anti-source control, anti-DevOps but injecting a file from here. You should do this in a better way, but I could show you it's all unprepped demos. So if it breaks, we're not really gonna worry too much about it. Um, we call this the multi-stage Mert pipeline, not YAML. There we go. That's my file. We're now from here. Copy paste again. Don't do this in production. I'm just freestyling mm -hmm. a little bit. Don't go back and like tell your DevOps managers like, look how cool this is. I can copy paste directly in repos. Don't do this. <laughs> Although I mean source control is is still there. I could create pull requests for changes. I got the history of my commit, so in the end, everything is there, but don't do this directly from within your repos, I would say. So now I can go back to my pipelines, create a new pipeline. And on Azure, you can do this. Instead of starting and following the wizard, mm -hmm. I can now, I hope it's in this one. I actually need to remember. Oh no, what did I do? Instead of creating a new one, I should have picked an existing one. What did I miss? Let me go back. Mm. I'm getting confused. I was a bit too fast, but I have no idea what I missed. Uh, repos. Arm. I was expecting a question like, which one do you want to use? So let's try something. And pasting it in again here. <laughs> It's not going to run because some of the, the settings that it sends in this environment. But I just want to show you like one output in the portal that's giving you that multi stage environment. And it's thinking about it. There should be a nice diagram showing up here with the two different stages. That authorized step makes sense because it's pointing to um, a service connection that technically doesn't exist anymore. But I would still hope that it was showing me the outcome. It's not showing because the connection is wrong. Otherwise, it was a little bit identical to the uh, the graphical release stage one, stage two, where now it's clearly identifying the stage build because that's the name we gave it and the release or whatever name you want to give it. Out of a YAML pipeline would be the same thing, but you saw the syntax. Um, by the way, I do have the files on my GitHub repo. So if you want to play with it yourself, um, let me know. More than happy to, uh, to point you where to find them. Now let's go back to our release because there's another thing I can show you with 
the release and integrating like an approval step or integrating some, oh, that's actually right. We do have 10 minutes, perfectly fine. Uh, what do you mean by approval? Then do you mean yeah, so, like I want to um, so, um, push my cost to CI and everything pass with my CI pipeline and it comes to the CD. I need approval from, for example, my manager or someone yep. who is right to exempt. Yeah, because if I go back to my uh, pipeline structure, um, let's move this out of the way and go back to the definitions. Oh, yes, I think we changed pass, right? Where did we add two stages? I forgot about it. I'm too excited about all the demos. <laughs> Hmm. Oh, ah, that's where it is. <laughs> I didn't save it yet. There we mm -hmm. go. Now let's let's save it first, just to be clear. Cool. Because right now I'm running my dev environment, so the CI part is covered. We have a change in the source code, and the, the trigger is picking it up, and it produces a new artifact. If we now want to move it to the next stage, everything is going to run fine. My dev stage will be complete, and that's going to trigger the production one and production two. But maybe in between, you want an approval. So what we have is these little icons here, what we call pre and post control mechanism. So you can identify individuals or security groups and nominating um, somebody to approve it. Could be one individual, could be a group, or you can uh, specify how many um, actually need to approve it. You could do the same in source control, by the way, before um, accepting a pull request that uh, you first gonna get it validated by like one or two or more individuals, that's also an option. So let's say here, before I'm triggering my production deployment, I want someone to approve it. So we run our dev environment, would be possible before kicking off the dev to also have an approval, where now you could integrate and allocate myself. It's obviously not the best way to do this, but I didn't invite you in my project, although technically I could. And then having anyone who's showing up in this list of users um, could technically approve it. There is some fall proof scenario that the one who's requesting the release cannot approve it, which somehow makes sense. For now, if I kick this off, you're going to see there's a little flag here, and it's waiting for an approval. That's one option. The other option is integrating more advanced, what we call um, yeah, control gates or release gates. Those are like the, the terminology we use. And it's super powerful. And let me show you some of the capabilities we offer. And this is just a baseline. You can go to the DevOps marketplace and integrating some other ones from third-party plugins. But for example, Azure Policies, it's the mechanism in the Azure platform allowing you to validate deployments. You saw in my variables, I'm targeting West Europe out of my ARM template, well, actually out of my variable definition, right? Now imagine for whatever reason, um, I'm not allowed to deploy anything in West Europe. The way Azure DevOps is going to work is running the dev deployment, running the production deployment, where maybe in the dev stage, I could deploy it in West Europe. But for production, I cannot because my target is um, a different subscription, not allowing West European um, as an Azure region, just an example. Or in my definition, I'm running specific virtual machine sizes, and I'm not allowed to use them. Now, in the, the pure DevOps mindset, my pipeline is going to kick off. It's going to try and run, but the Azure pro platform, the Azure resource providers are blocking me 
So in the end, my pipeline run will fail. So why not making it smarter and giving it over to the platform? Hey, Azure, what is the state of the platform? And am I allowed to run it? That would be the mindset. Or Azure Monitor. Based on Azure Monitor alerts, out of App Insights, out of basically anything running on Azure, whenever there's an alert showing up, we could send that information back to the pipelines and using that as a blocking mechanism. Like you don't need to push a new pipeline because that resource is down or that region is down. Or maybe the opposite, you're going to trigger the pipeline because you need more compute instead of having five VMs, 50 VMs, whenever there's an Azure Monitor alert kicking in, you're going to use that as a mechanism to enforce the deployment. That's another way. Or back where I started almost like an hour ago, using work items. You already know the work items. It's your project management. So maybe you don't want, I don't know, Peter to deploy a new version of the application because Peter first needs to fix the 25 bugs in work item uh, reporting. Or he first needs to fix all the tasks before releasing a new run, things like that. And then Sonar Cloud, I don't have the time to talk about Sonar Cloud, but it's um, another interesting one. It's a third party tool that allows you to run code scanning. So allowing you to validate, like, um, are you using any vulnerabilities? Are you using any um, outdated packages? Are you having any overall security vulnerabilities? And based on the feedback from that Sonar engine, again, we're going to allow or block the deployment. So that's approvals and the release gates. So let me show you what this looks like. I'm first going to delete this one. And specifying my gates every five minutes, that should be fine. And check Azure policy. In this Azure subscription for all resource groups, that should be okay. Kicking off the release. That's the definition. Now, we only got like a few minutes left. So I'm going to steal a demo from another session I did last week where I can show you the outcome. As you can see here, my deployment is waiting. And what it's doing is checking on work items and checking on Azure policy. So I use the exact same pipeline trying to target West Europe, but I do have a policy in place in Azure that's blocking me from using um, anything in Azure West Europe. And that's the validation happening every five minutes, 15 minutes, depending how you specify it. It's blocking because I got too much work on my plate. So it's blocking because of the work items. It's allowing the deployment for the policy compliance, and you can really mix and match. So as long as I'm not cleaning up my work items, it's not allowing me to run my deployment. And to show you that I do have some outstanding work to be done, those are my work items. So super easy, but awesomely powerful. A little bit of cloud magic, and I think that's a, a good way to close if there's any questions coming in, feel free to let me know. Um, but that's everything I think I wanted to cover. Do you have any other questions in the last couple of minutes we have? Yes, I wonder, are there any best practices for um, creating a CI-CD pipeline? Any best practices? Um, I would say if you start looking into using YAML instead of the classic. Again, there's nothing wrong with classic, but YAML is probably the, the way forward. And even if you have classic pipelines today, you can actually migrate. It's not really migrating, but for every 
classic pipeline, although this is probably not a classic. Um, there is a button to translate a wrap up package. Translate it into YAML syntax. For the builds, for the release, would technically be the same because it's a pipeline. But if I select a step here, I can do view YAML and it's going to produce the YAML snippet for that specific task. So if you remember one of my first pipeline demos, install NuGet, so the NuGet add one, the VS build add one, then running the testing. If you have it in a classic pipeline like I'm having right here, it takes me five minutes to literally copy everything over in a new YAML pipeline, having the benefit that it's part of my um, source control. So that would be one of the best practices um, I could definitely recommend. Um, second one, um, start small. Don't make it too complex. Reuse what you have. Like I showed you, you have Azure CLI, you have PowerShell scripts. Um, move everything in repos and start from there. If you already use GitHub, you can reuse it, integrate it. So don't make your project too complex. I would say start small. Try to um, find some quick wins, like optimizing a deployment, moving it into some basic but useful pipeline, integrating the approvals, the quality gates. Um, it's something that I always recommend because it's so powerful. So um, those are like just a couple of them that I could uh, come up with top of mind. Okay, and I have a last question for you. Are there any spoilers for upcoming releases on Azure DevOps? Um, not that much. Um, but it's not that the product is not getting updated. It's actually getting updated um, almost every month. If you want to stay up to date, the source there is devblogs.microsoft.com. That's the landing page from the development team and the cloud advocacy team where they provide like monthly updates besides all the other interesting blog posts, including some of my own. But there is also a monthly update post with upcoming changes. So that could be one. Um, one thing that I didn't really talk about, um, but I'm quite sure that's a question from the audience, like what's happening with GitHub Actions? Should we use GitHub Actions? Should we use Azure DevOps pipelines? And I'm going to steal one more minute. That's fine. But GitHub Actions is a pipeline engine within GitHub. And to show you some of its capabilities, this is one for publishing just an index HTML file, nothing too fancy. But behind GitHub Actions is a powerful pipeline engine. So instead of starting from scratch and building your own, you could actually start from here. Now you could in the meantime, trigger an Azure pipeline from GitHub Actions or integrating GitHub Actions into your Azure DevOps pipelines. So the two worlds are nicely working together. A little bit what I mentioned uh, all the way at the beginning, a lot of capabilities in Azure DevOps. If you don't want to use all of it, perfectly fine. And why not integrating actions with some pipelines you already have, but keeping Azure boards for the project management, keeping um, the documentation like Wiki, something I didn't mention, but in Azure boards, there's also a Wiki engine allowing you to automate your documentation process. And it's it's also available in, in GitHub Actions, but it's not exactly the same. The capability is identical. It's a pipeline engine. Not to do any negative about it, it's actually super powerful. It's just a different tooling with similar capabilities. So for the ones who are into, I don't know, the decision making, like should I move to Azure DevOps? Should I move to GitHub Actions? Um, my personal recommendation would be check out both of them because there's a lot of really cool things, a lot of 
magic if you want, back to my title. In Azure DevOps, a lot of magic in actions um, out of GitHub uh, pipeline actions. And just try to, to look at the best of both worlds. I think that's a, a nice closing um, recommendation there. Okay, um, before we finish, I want to add another question, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, no, okay. Uh, is there any difference between the Azure DevOps servers and Azure DevOps services? I mean, the on-prem version and the cloud version. Um, well, functionally, without checking the documentation and mapping the two uh, side by side, um, overall, there's no real difference in capability. Like this is something you can do in services, but not on the server or the other way around. Nothing that really comes to mind. Um, I would say the the main difference is like where you're going to host it. The the DevOps server is where you run it typically in your own on-prem data center or why not in, in Azure VMs. Um, but it's not running as a cloud service. So you need to install it. You need to manage it. You need to build VMs. So that would be the, the, the main difference there. So it's more like um, a security decision, not that the cloud version is not secure, certainly not, but just keeping it closer to your data center. If you still have more deployments going on in um, your own data center, maybe the server edition could be recommended. Although technically you can also deploy it from cloud. So it's mainly just an overall decision where you want to run your resources and just using the, the deployment engine um, in the same location. I think that makes most sense then. So we can get the same experience as we are using the on-prem version. Yeah, I could look in, in some official link, but you probably find it in the docs. That's having a mapping between services capabilities and server capabilities. But as you said, for now, I would say it's it's uh, quite identical. Okay. So, Peter, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, I think it was a very pleasure. educative session. Thank you. And hope to see you again in further episodes. Cool. So, again, I would say, um, Mert, first of all, to you, thank you for um, having me here on, on, uh, on the show. For anyone watching the, the session or recording, feel free to reach out, email, Twitter, by preference, but I'm all over the place. So. Besides that, I hope you learned something, you enjoyed it, you liked more demos than just that one slide, and hope to see you again in an, uh, any other session on DevOps. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.